Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson, and you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. As our field increasingly needs us to be more creative, more innovative, and more effective, a career in music can be approached in a lot of different ways. In our bonus episode series, Mavericks, we bring you the voices of some of the Double Read community's biggest trailblazers, each forging their musical path in their own way. For our fourth Mavericks episode, we welcome bassoonist Erin Oft. Erin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'd love to start by asking you to tell us who you are and what you do. I am a bassoonist. I teach at a university. I am full-time there. And I also have a YouTube and blog um, through Raff Reads, which is my personal read-making business as well as lessons that I offer. Um, I'd love to talk more about your YouTube channel, which is, I think, um, how a lot of our listeners know you. And I know a lot of people are really excited about this interview. Could you talk to us about um, how that came about and uh, what you wanted to accomplish with your YouTube channel? That is such a great question. Okay. When I started my YouTube channel, it was, first off, there was nobody watching. And I ran into a problem teaching at Jacksonville State University that I was simultaneously teaching a class while class woodwinds was being offered. So I wasn't able to make it into lecture on bassoon for the class woodwinds. So what I did is I realized that if I filmed all of the videos that class woodwinds would need, that I could fulfill both of those roles and being in two places at once. So that was the initial thought that kind of went into it. But then I started realizing that my students in my private studio were watching the videos and that they were using it as a way to make sure that they were getting concepts from the lessons so that they didn't have that little bit of, I walked into a lesson and I know you covered it last week and I thought I got it, but then I got into the practice room and I didn't know if I was doing it right, so can we recover that? They had that tool accessible to them at any time whenever they wanted it. But the real thing that was the game changer for me was that it was a personal level. Um, it allowed me in many ways to start charting my own bassoon adventures and the growth that I was having because I don't know if I'm the only person out there that's like this, but I'm very hard on myself. And I think in the era of social media, it is very easy to fall into the comparison game. Mm -hmm. And I was comparing myself to other bassoonists and their career and their path and their journey. And I love being so connected that I get to see what everybody is doing, but I wasn't viewing my own Mm -hmm. path that way. And so when I started filming the things that I was working on, it became like an online journal and diary, but it also helped me isolate what I was doing and why. And then also I started being more gentle with myself and I started enjoying my career more because I could see the things that I was doing and I could chart that I was making progress. Because when I finished college, I think I kind of hit a free fall. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who goes through this, but you don't have a teacher anymore. And when I went to school, I went to Indiana University, and the bassoon studio was huge. And because there were so many bassoonists, there was always somebody doing something neat and innovative. And so I was constantly inspired and bouncing ideas off of this community that I had there. And when I took the job in teaching, everyone was looking to me to be that person. And I was still trying to create that community, but I wasn't in a location where I was surrounded by so many bassoonists on a constant basis, and this has allowed me that in a different way than I ever thought possible. I totally hear you about the, um, at first no one was watching, I feel like, and not I feel like we have the stats. The first few episodes, the top listeners were <laughs> Galit's mom, Galit's dad, <laughs> and my mom. Um, <laughs> so how did you... Um, not necessarily go about, but what was the journey from these videos being a resource for you at your university and your students at your university to having 
tens of thousands of views? Did that happen kind of like viral, you know, big wave at once or was it gradual? There were little bumps along the way. Um, I noticed that music schools actually started picking up on what I was doing. And I think this is because in education, we're realizing that the typical jobs of going and getting an orchestral job or going and getting a, um, a job in a university and that being a lifelong career, that's not necessarily what is fostering a career in music anymore. So more and more, they're pushing for entrepreneurship. And when they started realizing that I was doing was entrepreneurship and people started talking about it, major music schools started following me. And I, I got the stats of when they were following me. But once the uh, faculty at those universities started following me, then the students at those locations started following me. And then that's when it got a little bit real because that's when I realized, okay, this is bigger than I had ever anticipated um, it being. I was just, I mean, if you even look at my beginning videos, I'm goofing around. There are videos when I didn't know if I could do this where um, they are froofy and have absolutely nothing to do with bassoon because I was testing the waters, and I'm glad I gave myself that freedom so that I could figure out how to work the camera, how to, um, how to stand in front of the camera, how to speak to the camera, because it's awkward because you guys are very lucky you have someone to talk to directly. Mm-hmm. Just talking to a camera can sometimes uh, almost be dehumanizing. But the more I get to know my subscriber base, the less awkward that is. But in the beginning videos, I think that's the number one reason why I wasn't as comfortable as I could have been because I was just talking to a camera. Did your um, increase in listenership change your content at all and the angle that you were talking about, you know, the um, bassoon content and the lectures and things like that? That is such a good question, and I have to admit that I do check up on my subscriber base. Um, Specifically, the one that it shifted the most was when I did the video on playing bassoon standing up. Because as a woman playing bassoon standing up, you're going to use a harness of sorts. And as a female, you are going to have attributes that might get in the way of standing up or which harness you would choose. And knowing that my subscriber base was 75% male on YouTube made it a different way that I was going to speak to that. Whereas if I was in a room full of women, I think I would have been um, even more blunt. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's just different physical anatomy that goes with playing the instrument, just different Mm -hmm. body types. Um, Can you talk to us a little bit about what it is like to run your own reed-making company, how that came about? And I feel like I don't have time to make reeds for myself. I don't know how you're doing it with a full-time job plus a thriving (laughs) YouTube channel. Um, What does this uh, business read woman hat look like? That is is another really great question. When I started making the reads, I had a lot of students that were bringing in store-bought reads. And I know that many of these store-bought reads are highly manufactured, um, and they do not have hand scraping. And I found that how you take the cane off the reed can drastically shift the way it performs, like what angle you're scraping at or if you're using sandpaper or if you're using a file, per se. I found myself trying to fix the store-bought reads to do what I wanted them for that student and that that was taking more time than it would take me to make a blank. And when I realized that I could make a blank and scrape it down in less time than adjusting one, I realized it was time to go ahead and go into business. So at first I was just making reads for my students, but then I realized that because of the YouTube channel and how much I was talking about the read experiences that I was having with various types of cane, that it would be really beneficial to start making reads for some of the people that were interested. And that's when I made them available to everybody. Um, Before I ever make a read for someone, I am very curious about what instrument type they have, what vocal type they have, where they live so I can gauge the altitude and the weather. And then for me, I love it because it allows me to go ahead and sit down and plan the read that they need for their instrument. So if they're playing on a very flexible instrument, I'm not going to make as flexible of a read. 
um, or vice versa. To find the time to do it, um, I have streamlined some of the things that I do in order to make the reads. I don't have very much cane that I need to take off. I have a standard profile that I set and use. Um, I stick with a shape that I know is good universally on most bassoons. Um, I call it the shape that's like the sweatpants of reeds. It's going to be comfortable for everybody. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I don't do a lot of experimenting. I do the experimenting for myself and my own personal read making. But when I'm making as a pretty uniform product and then altering the amount of flexibility it has based on the instrument that they send me that they're playing on. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and ask about um, your work uh, in music history pedagogy, um, which you teach at Jacksonville State. And uh, and how you worked with Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor into um, revolutionizing it. This was one of my favorite things that I have ever done as part of my entire career. I am so glad you asked because I feel like I can't put it on YouTube because I'm so sensitive with copyrights on YouTube that I don't actually discuss it. But what I realized when I worked with Dr. Taylor is that the brain, the brain that you have as you're functioning, you have, of course, the right and the left side of the brain, but you also have the amygdala. And I suffered from a lot of performance anxiety when it came to test taking. It was a very rigorous degree program that I went through. And as I was struggling, I realized that I was only trying to store the, the ideas and the facts in the left side of my brain. But what she helped me do is store them in both the right side and the left side of my brain and enjoy it. I think this is best explained through examples. So if you have the Baroque figures of music history, you have, of course, Handel, you have Vivaldi, and you have J.S. Bach. Now, in order to remember that all three of those composers go together, I have them linked in my mind with the McDonald's characters. And, of course, they're pop culture. So for McDonald's, you have Ronald McDonald. And Ronald McDonald has, of course, red hair, just like Vivaldi has red hair. <laughs> <laughs> Vivaldi worked at the Pio Aspidella della Pieta, which translates to hospital. And Ronald McDonald has a hospital. <laughs> and both of them are for young children. Then there was also J.S. Bach, and J.S. Bach, I link to the Hamburglar, and I link him to the Hamburglar because the Hamburglar is always known for stealing Ronald McDonald's hamburgers, and in many ways, J.S. Bach also stole the music, I should say stole in print, like air quotations, he stole the music of that of Vivaldi because he was copying it down, so in essence, he's stealing the product of Ronald McDonald. Um, and you also have the key element that J.S. Bach did go to jail, so the whole, like, Hamburglar, the striped uh, jail suit outfit completely fits. And then you have Grimace, and Grimace is linked to Handel, largely because in the Baroque era, if you had a large amount of finances, which Handel did because he was receiving patronage from so many monarchies, you would eat to excess. And Grimace, in many ways, demonstrates that eating to excess, the financial stability that they had during that time period. So um, I kind of use all three of the McDonald's figurines in order to say you already know the McDonald's characters. These are part of everyday culture. So you're linking to what you already know. And by linking to what you already know, you're not starting from scratch, trying to build connections in your brain. You're also noting that they all come from the same time period and that they're all linked together because of that. So the students, when they start to get stressed, what they do is I'll say, I mean, this is just, we have this for every time period with different composers, just different pop culture elements. But if they get stuck, I try to link to the pop culture elements of that era. And once they have one of those key elements, they go first into the right side of the brain. Because when you're in fight or flight, You'll move from the amygdala first to the right side of the brain, which is the creative side. And then from there, you'll move into the fact side of the left side of the brain. But if you try to go straight from the fight or flight just to basic facts, the brain doesn't do it. So by going first 
from the fight or flight into the right, and then opening up those key characteristics in the left side of the brain, they have a higher success rate. And I watched the overall test scores jump over 15 to 20% within a year of doing this. That's amazing. That's totally amazing. It just, it moved it out of the core element of memorization, regurgitation, and then forget it. Um, so this way they have fun, they learn, and they also have the longevity. So it's not just the in-class test scores, but also on a national level, level, we've moved to higher test scores than we've ever seen before. Do you use that technique with your bassoon students too? Yes. Yes, and largely because it allows the music of that era to come alive. And um, just as you guys are making many of the performers that you speak with accessible, it also allows the composers to be accessible, which oftentimes, I mean, when we speak of, like, great composers such as J.S. Bach, I mean, we have them on a pedestal. We forget that they are human beings, that they were living real lives. And when we talk about it in a way that it's linked to our pop culture, there's an accessibility that is unique to each individual that they latch on to that I find fascinating. So I hear you talking about um, you're teaching a music history class and then you tried to figure out the way to do it most effectively and you had these videos and then you took that to the next level and you were making reads for your students and then you took that to the next level and you strike me as someone who really cares to do the absolute best that she can do in every avenue that you're functioning in. Um, so I'd like to know how you maintain that level of inspiration and how you approach self-care with all the things you have going on. I love this. Um, that was so complimentary. First off, thank you. But I love that you guys consistently address self-care because I think that in the musician world, we can go, 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 and then forget that we need to give back to ourselves. And that in order to be inspired and in order to create our best art, we need to do things that we find nurturing and fuel that, that well, that we give back to it. So we don't just take from it, but that we, we instill good qualities of nurturing and caring for ourselves because when you're in art you are giving 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 and I don't know about you guys but there have been times when I finished a major concert series that I just felt empty um, and I did have to take a time out so one of the big things that I do is that I only create when I feel that I have something to say so I try to stick to a Sunday upload for my YouTube channel but Sometimes that just isn't, it doesn't work, and it doesn't work largely because I'm refueling that well. Um, so the things that I will do, I love to um, take my dog for a walk. I love to, uh, you know, read a good book, go to the movies. The salt bath, I think, is one of the most important things that I do for myself as far as um, nurturing and making sure that I'm keeping my body open and flexible. Um, I'm a yogi by nature, so I love to do yoga and stretch my body out. And I think this is in large part because as a bassoonist, we are twisted to the right. And if you're spending most of your time twisted to the right, if you don't do a counter twist back to the left for at least part of the day, you're going to end up stuck, I think, with one arm longer than an other because you're constantly twisted. So I like to do yoga to first twist myself back out. But when you do that, you release a bit of toxins into the bloodstream. And by doing an Epsom salt bath, I'm able to then pull those out of my skin. And I find that there's less chance of me getting sick or getting as exhausted because I'm pulling, uh, pulling that out. But I'm also giving back to my body. Do you have any special time management strategies that you use um, <laughs> keeping all of these balls in the air? Curious minds would like to know. Yes, please tell. <laughs> I do. I really do. I have some strategies of that I make reads on set days um, so that I know that they will be dried out and ready to go in advance for when I have the orders that come in. I also am very careful about where I spend my time um, and where I budget my time. So if there's something that is not as important, then I will go ahead and move that to the back burner. Um, and I'll revisit it when it, the time is right. I don't, I think it's very easy to fall into a guilt trap about that. That 
you know, you have to do everything all at once. And it may appear on some level that I somehow am doing that, but I am seriously not. I am setting a goal, and then I achieve that goal, and then I go to the next goal, and I'm very focused about doing one thing at a time. It's when I try to multitask that I am more prone to making mistakes and not doing as good a job as I want to. And being a little bit of a perfectionist, which I think most musicians are because we have such an attention to detail, I like to feel good about what I am creating. And that's part of the joy that it brings as well. I I think we all started making music because it brought us joy. And, you know, we're very lucky as bassoonists and oboists that we get arts and crafts. And arts and crafts is what I call read making. So it allows us that freedom to create and meditate as we do that. It's a very quiet activity. But then, you know, we if I do it all at once, it's too much. You budget it out. out. I don't know if that was too roundabout or not. I was like <laughs> listening it. to myself and I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, I will admit I do not probably sleep as much as I should. But it's because I'm being driven and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And because there's joy in going after what you want to create, it has a different kind of finesse than if I was going and working a job that I didn't enjoy or I didn't want to do. Um, I'm definitely in the career path that is my dharma, if you will. Uh, Another thing that you do is teach Skype private lessons. Can you talk to us about that and the types of students that you encounter when teaching over Skype and just kind of maybe the unique challenges or benefits of teaching in that medium? This is my favorite part of my career. I know that this is up and coming for many people, and uh, I think there are a lot out there that wonder whether or not they should be teaching Skype lessons, and I have found for my younger students that the parents love it because they are not running around to get to all of the different events, that they can be at home and they can cook dinner and they can still make sure that their um, their child is still getting good instruction. And that was my initial thought when I started it. But since then, and because of the YouTube channel, this has been an opening doorway for my own music studio into the world. I have taught lessons in Australia. I have taught lessons in Brazil. I have taught master classes in Korea. It is the most fascinating element ever. So um, it's also allowed me to have direct access to the people that are subscribed to my YouTube channel because usually if it is a professional player, I will ask them what they specifically are looking for prior to the lesson. And sometimes they're looking for Um, work on their instrument and specific excerpts, but more than often they are looking for read help. And so knowing exactly what kind of sounds they want to create, which the global sounds of bassoon differ so much by location. And I'm not talking about the uh, intonation of where they're at. The overall timbre and the tone colors that they are searching for is so unique and different. And it's I mean, it's open doors like full discussions that I I do not believe that I would have if I was only focused on the United States and not looking at the music world as a global community, largely because, I mean, I've I've had full meetings where we discussed cryogenically frozen vocals, and I, I had not heard of that until I was speaking to bassoonists that were specifically looking for a brighter sound than we in the United States would naturally gravitate towards. Hmm. So looking at the world and the sounds that are created around the world, unique to each location and also to each performer, and the cane that they choose based on that, the style of instrument that they're matching with each vocal, and then helping them foster and create that, I'm getting as much out of the lessons, if not more, I feel like than the person who is paying for the Skype lesson. And more often than not, I can't, I sit down and I'm like, I cannot believe I'm getting paid for this. This is the most magical thing I'm doing in my career. This is, um, it's fascinating, largely because I did not know about the global differences to the extent that it exists. Our studio in college was very global, but this is, this is to a whole new level. How do you solve some of the logistical challenges of teaching master classes and lessons through the Internet? 
lots of cameras. <laughs> I have to say that um, the students and the willingness for the students to move the camera so that I can see exactly um, what it is that's happening, um, making sure that I mention to them if I need them to turn on more lights so that I can get a better view. But in almost all of the lessons, I have the student turn to a side angle. And by getting a side angle, I can see the embouchure. Um, I can also see the front half of the bassoon as their hands are hitting it, but I can also see what their thumbs are doing. If they place the camera so that um, I, the camera's on their right side, then you get to see both hands instead of the body getting in the way. And then I like to go ahead and at some point in the lesson have them move so that they're facing the camera straight on so that I can see what the front of the embouchure is doing. When it comes to reed making, that is a little bit more of a challenge. You do have to aim the camera downwards so that you can actually see how they are scraping on the reed or how they are taking the cane off and what angle the um, knife or file is at in order to do that. Um, it's also very helpful if they have a micrometer and a light on hand so that they can hold the light directly behind the reed um, so we can look for hyperpigmentation um, to see if what they're doing is actually scraping for a dark spot on the cane or if that dark spot is actually more cane that would maybe need to be removed. And that's where a micrometer really comes in handy. So that I do read making more at the advanced level with students, but overall the bassoon performing lessons is just navigating the camera and a willingness to move to figure it out. Um, when I started, I didn't have all of the answers, but as I progressed, I realized, okay, can you show me this and move in a way that I can see what's happening. So as long as everybody on both ends is flexible, I have yet to have any challenges that can't be overcome. That's great. We've spoken about you a lot as a pedagogue thus far in this interview. Um, do you have similarly creative endeavors as a performer that you're embarking on or kind of talk to us about what some of the um, performing activities you have kind of recent or coming up maybe? Yes, I have. So, okay, so as part of my YouTube channel, I put out a request to receive uh, folk music uh, from around the world, and then uh, the folk music based on traditional tunes or based on traditional dances, and then I wanted to learn and integrate those dances into solo bassoon music, um, maybe bassoon that is accompanied by a couple extra instruments so that it allows for the global community that I'm creating um, a discussion and a dialogue for them to submit music, but also music that maybe I wouldn't be as familiar with, so that it fosters more of the communication and outreach. So I have two of the pieces that I am currently working on already. The first of these is from Australia, and it's Waltzing Matilda, and that was uh, submitted by a YouTube subscriber as a piece that they wanted written for uh, Solo Bassoon. And I have to admit that when I first got the music for it, I looked it up, and although it's in English, there were a lot of words that I did not know. So I had to actually read articles on what all of the what all of the words meant because Australia, of course, is uh, still in English but different with dialect as well as with the terms that they would use. So that's the first piece that I'm working on. Um, we're also looking into a couple of other pieces to transcribe them out for bassoon. And then my goal is to go ahead and record these and make them available so that they have not only the sheet music for more literature, so that other bassoonists can have a greater access to the global bassoon community, but um, also so that they have recordings of the pieces available to them. So are you composing full-on works for solo bassoon based on these folk melodies? Yes. I, I would choose to maybe look at it more of transcribing, and I will not say that I'm doing it all myself. I have the uh, final editorial note, but the uh, composer that I work with here at Jacksonville State University, James Woodward, he is taking the initial element, and then he's helping decide what um, alternate instruments would best suit the location for backup. And then um, we're combining them together to make them accessible. So it's a collaborative project. That's so cool. Um, so you've obviously inspired a lot of people through your YouTube channel, and I think especially younger viewers. What advice do you have for a young double read player who maybe has some new ideas on how they can make their own mark on our field? 
for young bassoonists or young double reed players, I should say. For young double reed players, I would definitely suggest on building a musical community, largely because my musical community has fostered so much of my own personal growth, especially postgraduate, um, going into the teaching field, going into the performing world. The gigs that I have been called for have all been based off of people that I have met through musical endeavors. The uh, way that I bounce ideas off of colleagues is always through building of a musical community. So although my YouTube channel has my name on it, the collaborations that I have been able to film and also most of the videos before I ever put them into production, I will usually speak to about three or four other musicians that I know that are part of my musical community and bounce ideas off them and then wonder, okay, so would this work for you? Do you, how would you think about this? And, uh, I do research with many of those other people in my musical community. So the number one thing I could say is Build strong foundational friendships that are real and authentic because these people will help you in your darkest days and in your brightest days. They will be your cheerleaders, your champions, and they will help you grow to musical heights that you never thought you could. And I think that's what I love so much about what you guys are doing as well as maybe what I'm doing is that it's very innovative, but we're also making people accessible and what they think and their ideas accessible. But mine are all based in a community, just as yours are based in a community of speaking to other people. So the more I could say, build those good friendships, they will help you more than you'll ever imagine. That's would That would be my number one piece of advice. And that your career is going to go in the direction that's right for you. So don't worry about comparing yourself to anybody else. This is your path. You mentioned earlier when you talked about your um, work with Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, uh, the Harvard brain scientist, about how um, connecting the two halves of the brain helped you with performance anxiety. Can you talk a little bit more about your um, journey into feeling comfortable while you're performing? I think that the work that I did in being more comfortable performing all centered on the breath. And once I could calm the breath, I felt like I could move the air and breathe as I naturally would when I was practicing. And although that's a challenge because your inner metronome, which is your heart, can be going 90 miles an hour trying to slow the breath, you're, you're never going to completely get there. But taking a breath low and deep will allow that adrenaline that you have that's causing the heart rate to speed up to find focus and direction so that you're, you're circulating all of those chemicals throughout your body. And I, this is the other thing that I do have to credit my uh, teacher in college, Kim Walker. She noted that the chemical in the body for adrenaline is the same as excitement and fear. Those are the same chemical. It's all in how you view it. So I, that for me was a huge perception shift that, um, the, the chemical that was making me anxious or nervous was also the same as excited. And once I realized I was very excited to go out and perform, I was able to breathe deeper and lower and circulate that chemical reaction, allowing myself to get a good, low, deep breath so that I could express myself just as I had in the practice room. As a professional read maker, what um, read making advice uh, do you have for us and our listeners? And maybe also, what's the best read making advice um, you've received? The best read making advice I have ever received is that it is okay for me to draw on the read. And when I say draw on the read, I do use a really soft, dull pencil. And I find that by drawing on the read, I'm able to locate where the knife is taking cane off versus where it is not taking cane off. This also allows me to make sure I'm not scraping in areas where I wouldn't want to, but I'm also scraping where I do want to. So for me, that that was a game changer in my read making style. I've also noted that softer cane, I actually leave heavier in the dimensions, whereas harder cane, I can go much lighter. So understanding if you have a harder piece of cane or softer piece of cane from the get-go will help you understand what the read is capable of. 
I don't use a hardness tester on the reeds in order to do this. Um, after a while, you'll find that the way the cane scrapes off the reed, if it's coming off in ribbons or if it's shredding or if there's a large amount of um, what looks like a castle wall, so if it's up, down, up, down, up, down, um, you'll start to see those fibers in the cane. And how those fibers remove off the cane is one of the fastest ways to know, I think, if you're dealing with a harder, soft piece of cane without having to spend all of the extra money with an indicator to do that. Erin, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. This has been a really wonderful and enjoyable conversation. Um, where can our listeners find you on the Internet? Thank you so much for having me. If you want to keep up on all of my bassoon adventures, you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. There's one other. Which one am I missing? Twitter? Twitter? Twitter, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of these I am at Erin Oft, um, and uh, it will be Erin Oft or ErinOft.com. That is my website. And I do have to say that my name is spelled with a Y. We can thank my parents for that. So it's E-R-Y-N. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.